Hello and thanks for joining us for this special episode of Talkertainment on Ghana Web TV. My name is Benefo Boabin Abrantipai. Today on the show we have a very special guest. He is an actor, a voiceover artist, um, illustrator, graphic designer. In fact, I read that he's a lover of music and theatre, everything acting. We'll find out more about this very personality who has been on so many stages putting smiles on the faces of the audience, everyone that, you know, goes to the theater to watch him. My guest today is Andrew Tando Adote. Big Boss, thanks for joining us. It's a pleasure to be here, Mr. Brantipa. How is everything? Uh, oh, all is well. The last time I saw you on stage was doing George Quay's um, production. Which one? Um, that was the, the Ghosts Are Not To Blame. Oh, yeah. Has, it, has there been another? After that? Yeah, the way, uh, they recently did um, Legend of Akusika. Oh, okay. Yeah, so that has been the last play that um, Image Bureau and April Communications have put out. Right. Uh, what was your role in that? I played the role of the sage. Um, those of you who know, who are familiar with the play, the sage is the being that comes to serve as uh, sort of the narrator of the play. Mm -hmm. And... Um, George and I came up with the idea of um, splitting the sage into two. So um, traditionally, the role has been played as a single male character, mm -hmm. but he decided to, they, they decided to change the character into a, a, one character with a male and female component. So we had two characters, myself and one great actress, uh, Gadadese Gwifia, who played the female part of the sage. Mm -hmm. I played the male part of the sage. So we delivered the lines um, uh, in a flowing fashion, and we had some dance choreographies um, as part of it. It was, it was fun. Looking at the, the, the roles that you've played, I guess that was, um, that was not challenging enough for you, was it? Um, that particular role? That particular role. I think, um, I mean, different plays challenge you in different ways. What, what was it challenging in the ways that I'm used to? No, but in the ways that I wasn't used to, it was challenging. I mean, um, I wasn't used to the uh, dance choreography kind of thing. Uh, it's not something I, I, I normally do. I'm not a dancer. And the role involved a lot of movement and a lot of dance-like, you know, choreography. So in that sense, yeah, it was, it was challenging to try to make myself look like I've, I've, I've been a dancer for years, but I'm not. You, you, have, you have been in so many productions. Um, which one would you say was the most challenging role for you? Oh, no, there's a bunch of them. Um, unfortunately, I can't single out one. But um, if I was to say, there was one play we did uh, in Riverman many years ago that I found quite challenging. Um, it was um, the Riverman take on the character switching bodies. Mm. So a husband and wife are arguing in the house and then one day a being comes and says, the two of you, you are always arguing, so I'm going to exchange your souls. So your husband, your spirit will enter your wife's body, your wife, your spirit will enter your husband's body, mm. and both of you will live as each other and see how it's like to be each other. Maybe you'll understand each other, basically. So I was the husband whose wife's spirit entered him and um, whose spirit entered his wife. And I had to play the role of a woman trapped mm -hmm. in a man's body. And um, yeah, that, that was, that always, um, I always remember that role as one of my most challenging. Um, to this day, I'm not sure if I got it quite right. Um, the next one that jumps out at me would be um, a play we did called Nicholas, where uh, we, we played, we told the story of the life of um, Archbishop Duncan Williams. Mm -hmm. And Uncle Bo um, asked me to play the Archbishop, which I found very daunting because I look I look nothing like him. <laughs> so trying to embody that character was a bit of a challenge. So and then of course um, the one I just did uh, as King Odewale, the gods are not to blame. Yeah. The, the the gods are not to blame. I've been preparing for that play for a very long time because. Um, Roverman is not the first theater group I joined. I joined a group before that, somewhere in 2005, 2006. And that was the play they were rehearsing when I joined the group. Mm -hmm. And I understudied 
King Odewale. But I never got to play the character. And it pained me because I was very eager. I had gotten bitten by the theater bug and I was very eager to prove myself. But the opportunity never came. And then all these years later, the same play landed on my lap again. Mm -hmm. So there was, it was, a, it was a, a challenge I've been looking forward to for a long time. So if you put me on the spot, I would say these three plays that I've mentioned were the, were the most challenging. How was the experience when you got, to, you got the script to act or play the role of Odewale, considering that you, you yearned to play that role uh, years back? Yeah, I mean, I'd even forgotten that um, I had done it and I had lost the opportunity many years ago. I had forgotten. It wasn't until we were reading, we were reading through the play, and I realized that the words seemed familiar. Then all of a sudden, all those memories came rushing back. So I was, when I remembered everything, my determination, I just felt this fire inside me, like God has brought this opportunity yeah. back to me. So. I was fired up. The whole play, I was fired up. I think I finished learning most of my lines before we started rehearsals mm -hmm. because I was that eager to, to really nail it. So, yeah, I was fired up. How did you get into this um, theater business? How did it all start? Um, it was a feeling. Like I, um, I said before we started rolling, theater has never really been... I wasn't one of those kids that was always performing and always acting and doing those things. You know, the, if you had known me from my childhood, you would have never, you would have said, oh, this guy will do something in visual arts because I could draw and I could paint and all that. But you would, you know, they would have never thought, even in secondary school, they would have never thought I would have gone into acting because I, I did not look like the type. I wasn't the outgoing, th dramatic type by any stretch of the imagination, you know. So even with me, it was, a, it was a, when I look back, I find it very interesting that something everybody says I can do so well, I was, I was never interested until after secondary school, you know. Yeah, so how I got into it, um, I got the opportunity to travel abroad. I went to Malaysia for an exchange program. I don't know exactly who I spoke to or what experience I had with who, that had me coming back wanting to explore my creative side and seeing what I can do to earn a living from it. Mm -hmm. But all I know is I came back with that, that desire to do things. So when I came back, I immediately began looking for opportunities to do voiceovers because I'd been told I had a nice voice. So I had been at the back of my mind that, oh, I can do voiceovers. So at the time, my big sister worked at CTFM I was friends with uh, Jessica, who also used to work there. And I spoke to her. I went to Jessica and said, they say I have a nice voice, so I want to do voiceover. And she was like, okay, you know, my very first uh, voiceover job and my, my first referral to another person for voiceover. But you knew you had a good voice. I'd, I'd been told. You didn't know. I didn't know, but I'd been told I had a, I had a nice voice. Mm -hmm. So after that, well, the person I went to, the person she referred me to, asked me if I could do storyboards. Storyboards are these, the terms they use for drawing, pre-conceptualizing, -con, pre whatever, whether it's an advert or a movie or whatever. I knew I could draw, but I didn't know what a storyboard was. So when he asked me, I could tell, okay, it has something to do with drawing. So I said, I can do it. So he said, okay, he'll meet me later. I went quickly, did research on storyboards. I said, okay, simply enough. Came back and started doing storyboards. So now I was doing advertising and story, uh, voiceovers and storyboards mm -hmm. for a long time. That's what I was using to make money. Of course, the illustrations. And then um, after, you know, I also went to meet Uncle Eboi for the, fair, for the second time. I had met him earlier, but not officially, you know. So I met him again and, you know, I went to see him because I could draw. I knew he had a magazine, so maybe he can pay me to do drawings for him. So I went to meet him. The deal went through, and I started doing illustrations also. So I had voiceovers, storyboards, and then illustrations that I was doing for quite a while. And then after a few months, he tells me, what else do I do? And at that time, I had just joined the theater group at the art center, so I told him I do some acting. 
and he said, okay, I'm working on something. When I, when I finish, I'll call you. When I'm ready, I'll call you. I mean, at the time, he was working on Roverman. Roverman, nobody knew what Roverman was. So when he was ready with the very first play, Unhappy Wives, Confused Husbands, he gave me a call to come in and audition. And then the rest is history. So that's kind of how my life started, you know, taking all these paths. When I came back from Malaysia, I had that desire to use what I, I felt God had given me. And I've been on that path ever since. You, you, you have been in many Uncle Bobo productions. Mm. Um, how has the experience been? When I joined um, Uncle Bo, uh, Roverman, I was at a stage in my life where, you know, I was lost and searching, searching for purpose, searching for um, grounding, you know, searching for wisdom, you know, and anything that can help me make sense of the world around me or make sense of myself. And meeting him has really helped me learn a lot about myself, a lot about my craft, a lot about people, and a lot about being an effective person in the world, being useful to the people around you, humility, um, patience, learning to work with people. I can say every, almost every people skill I have learned, almost everything that I am praised for by the people who work with me, I learned from him, either through his, his talks with us or his watching him interact with people and, and work with people, you know. So uh, Roverman was, was I, I can say with all confidence that it has been in that group that has made me who I am today. I heard Daddy wanted you to be a pharmacist. Yeah, my, my, my father was an engineer and um, he loved mathematics very much. Mm. And he didn't understand why I had such a hard time with mathematics, but it's just one of those things, I guess. He, he had a, um, he, he believed in the sciences and um, he was one of those parents who believed that, you know, you need to do science, something in science, mathematics. Uh, so he had wanted me to do pharmacy. He had mentioned it quite a few times. But um, you know, as fate would have it, um, unfortunately, uh, the powers that be uh, thought I would be a much better, mm -hmm. I'd be much useful to the world as a performer. So is it because you, you didn't like maths solely? That's the reason. Um, I, don't say, I wouldn't say I didn't like maths. I think for at least my generation, um, Mathematics was, uh, there was a bit of negativity surrounding mathematics mm -hmm. and it was, it was made to look like this, this thing that was so scary and so complicated and so highbrow that um, if you are dumb, you, you won't be able to get it, you know. So it, for a lot of us, we developed a, a negative attitude towards mathematics because of that and yes unless you are naturally inclined to numbers and things like that I was more creative visual and, and all those things but I truly believe that if I had been nurtured in an environment that didn't make mathematics look that way I mean in school you do mental and they beat you yeah. and things like that so Every from morning. from an early age you you develop a very negative perception subconscious negative perception towards mathematics and, and science. Mm -hmm. So you, you, you end up telling yourself it's something you don't want to do. And that, that kind of, it becomes a self-fulfilling prophecy. I think looking back, that's what I went through uh, with maths. I think if I, had, if I had been in an environment where it was a more friendly, maths was more friendly, those who taught maths was, were more friendly and more encouraging, I think um, it would have been better. I mean, there are people in Ghana, they do all these tough subjects and then they, they fail. Mm -hmm. And then some of them get the opportunity to travel abroad and the same subjects that they were failing at, they are excelling. 
you know. So that tells you it wasn't the it wasn't the subject; it was how the subject was taught and uh, the the attitude they were made to develop towards the negative attitude they were made to develop towards those subjects. So I think it's something we could we could look at in our educational system. But yeah, that's where that's where my apprehension towards uh, mathematics came from. How was life in school? Um, tell us how was young Andrew in school. Oh, young Andrew was. Um, was a was a chronic introvert um kept to himself most of the time um made very few friends um socially awkward a little you know and when you say socially awkward what? socially awkward i mean that kind of guy that you everybody will be in the room and then they'll see him and they look at him like, ah this guy what's wrong with him mm. is he okay is he something wrong with him? But were you were you okay? I was okay. Why were you always distant because in your? Because of how quiet I was, okay. because of how quiet and introverted I was, I wasn't outgoing or, you know, I wasn't smiling a whole lot. Mm -hmm. I learned I I didn't smile at all. Has that changed? Back in school, you? I'm told it hasn't changed. Even though <laughs> even though I make a, I make a conscious <laughs> effort to greet and mm -hmm. smile and all that, but um, when, when I'm unaware my face goes back to to yeah, that so yeah, yeah. i when i'm in a anyway, when i'm among people i'm trying to hey hello 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 but the moment i finish greeting people i, I think my face kind of goes back to that mm. thing and even on the set i dyed my the, my hair to play a role in a movie that will be coming out soon mm. and someone on the set was like you don't smile you know meanwhile this lady i greeted her and smiled I had smiled with her and greeted her before she did my makeup and all that. But she also said, I don't smile. So I guess I've made progress, but not enough. Yeah. Have you ever heard any awkward statements towards the way you are? Well, in secondary school, my favorite was in secondary school mm -hmm. because Form 1 and Form 2, I was the way I was. Mm -hmm. It wasn't in, until Form 3 that I began to open up. And these are with guys that I've been with from Form 1 and Form 2. So when I began to crack jokes, I'd gotten comfortable with them in the third year. This is things that people who get comfortable after a few months, it took me two years to get comfortable enough to be jovial and joke and laugh and things. And it was only then that my, my mates began to open up to me like, hey, you, we thought you were, you were an occultist in Form 1 <laughs> because you... The rumors that you, you wake up in, at midnight yeah. and sit on your bed and be chanting... Mm -hmm you know, at the stroke of midnight, and you know, you are, you are like a, maybe you do some juju or something. You but know, were you uh, doing those things? No, I wasn't. Uh, were you chanting? Because of, because of who I, like the kind of person they thought I was, mm -hmm. people had started making rumors about me that, uh, are you an occultist? Is he an occultist? Mm -hmm. And these were conversations that were going on behind my back. So when they, when we got to form three and they realized I was normal, now began to say, hey, are you, the way we were afraid of you in form, in form one, hey, we thought you were this, we thought you were this, we thought you were this. Mm -hmm. It was very interesting. So those have been my favorite uh, uh, comments that I've gotten because of the way I am. But theater, theater forced me to interact with people and um, open up a bit more, be more sociable, learn how to approach people, talk to them, ask questions and things like that. So it's something I've learned, but it... Unlike other people, I have to psych myself to say, okay, I'm going to be this kind of person in this environment. Then I do it. Once I'm done, I kind of go back to my default. Right. So let's take a quick break. When we return, there is more on Tokatainment on Ghana Web TV. <laughs> Welcome back. You're still watching Tokatainment on Ghana Web TV. We're still having a conversation with Adote. He is an actor, uh, graphic designer, and he loves art. He loves music. Share with us um, The Beast of No Nation. I mean, you, you, you acted um, in that movie. Share with us how you landed that role. Um, there was... Um, this was in the very beginning. There was a, a team that was coming from... Hollywood to come and look for actors to play in the movie. And um, by that time, Roverman had 
Roverman was make 2015, so mm -hmm. Roverman was was kind of a known name around, and some of the people who who organized the auditions came to the group because they, they, they had seen good actors there, myself included. So they came to the group, approached us with the opportunity to audition for it. So that's kind of how it happened. And um, around the time we auditioned, there was no play that we were rehearsing for. But somehow the dates, they kept shifting the dates. So when I auditioned and got the role, when I was informed that I had gotten the role, we were already hot in rehearsals for another play that we were going to do. So it became a bit of a difficult thing to manage. So what I told them was, I can't do it. They should find someone else. So when I told them that, they were like, OK. And then I was there. And then one lady, one of the acting coaches who had come to help the kids called me and tried to convince me to be part of the film. And that, you know, it's important to, to, it will be good on my resume. And I didn't know what resume was at the time. I didn't care. I said, I'll go on my IMDB too. I said, I didn't know what IMDB was. I didn't care. So she talked to me all that. And I said, okay, I've heard her. It's, uh, but I'm sorry, I can't do it. She should find someone else. So she also hung up. Then, I was doing my rehearsal, and then um, I got a call from the Ghanaians who worked with them that, what have I smeared on my face? I said, what are they talking about? He said, oh, now the director himself has called that they should make sure I am in the film. So that means, like, they are not taking no for an answer. I said, OK. So I went to see my boss, Uncle Ebu, and we worked out something. So at rehearsal, there will be a van waiting for me to take me to the location. So I'll pack my bags, come for a I'll finish, and then get on the van, and then they'll drive me up the mountains to the location. We shoot, and then I come back to, I come back to rehearsals. We do so. It took me from, you know, in between, um, um, from to and from rehearsal, and that's how I was able to shoot the movie. And I was, it was weird, because my appearance in the film didn't last more than five minutes. Mm -hmm. So I found it weird that they were, I, it, in my mind, in my mind, this is not a big role. Yeah. So why were they insisting that, you know, I, I play this small role? But yeah, that's what happened. Did it pay? Did it pay? Uh, no. Um, it, was, it was a very small role. I think the big money went to the, the, the big cast. But it was a very small role. And... Um, it was fine. I think how much was it? I've forgotten, but it wasn't. It wasn't a money, a money thing. You know, yeah. You've done movies. You've done stage play. Uh, between screen and stage, which one will you choose? I think I would choose stage. Because um, the screen ten, can get a bit tedious sometimes. Mm -hmm. You know, lo <coughs> location issues delays in in the little delays here and there in setting up you know and and it gets it gets tiring it gets tiring just waiting to shoot gets tiring and i don't because i'm from an environment where you don't stay still waiting to shoot one scene and waiting two hours for them to set up lights and all those things it bothers me so if I had to choose, I would choose, um, I would choose stage. Usually, what do, you, what do you do? How is the preparation like when you are going on stage? I mean, it involves rehearsals. Um, first, you discuss the play, then there's rehearsals. The rehearsals is where they teach you the blocking, how the character is supposed to walk, which direction he walks in, and things like that. So when you come and watch a stage play, when you see the character walking, it is not a random thing. They, it has been predetermined that when you are saying this line, walk here and turn here and look at this person. And, and so everything has been predetermined for you. But we make it look like we just felt like moving and we moved. So rehearsals um, um, is, is where the work is done, where the characterization happens. So by the time it's, you are going on stage, everything, if you've done enough work, Everything is on autopilot. You are moving naturally. You are saying your lines and things like that, mm -hmm. you know. So I try to 
take that method to the screen. You know, even though sometimes you don't have enough time to really, really embody the character. Screen in Ghana is a bit fast because, you know, the more days you spend, the more money you spend. So they try to make you get things done as fast as possible. So um, despite not having enough time, you try to still apply your stage, how you learn your stage on stage to, to the screen. You, you won a monologue challenge a few months ago. Uh, yeah. Tell us about that. It was, it was, um, it was a website uh, called thespian.com, and um, they had launched this uh, monologue challenge, and they were offering uh, some money, you know. It was in Naira. <laughs> it was in Naira. It looked like a lot of money. It was in Naira and all that. But um, I spoke to the owner of the website, you know, just to get a feel of what exactly this thing is. It is some kind of scam or what, but it seemed this was a guy who was, he's Nigerian, mm -hmm. it's owned, it's a Nigerian owned um, website. It seemed like the guy was just passionate about theater, passionate about arts and wanted to do something to contribute to the arts in Africa. So it was a very noble thing he wanted to do. So I said, okay. So I did the first one, which I won, uh, and then they sent me money. I said, oh, okay. <laughs> then he did a second one, which had even more money, mm. but it was more challenging. And I said, okay, let me do that one too. And then I won that, which was um, 500,000 Naira. And, you know, th that's when I did the, the, I did the photo shoot and the interview and all those things and made a lot of noise about it. So, yeah, basically that's how it came about, mm. um, yeah. How has that um, contributed to your brand? I got a huge um, influx of Nigerian followers um, because it's a Nigerian site mm -hmm. and a lot of people, a lot of Nigerians, you know, patronize the website. A whole bunch of Nigerian followers. I could, I had even lost count. So right now, I think I've, I've gotten some, some visibility mm -hmm. Uh, when it comes to that part of the world. The whole, my whole aim is to take my craft beyond the shores of Ghana. So I think it's in order that I begin to get a fan base also, even in Nigeria, so that, you know, one day, one day, I hope to, I hope to get to work with RMD and all those people. I've worked with RMD before in um, Shelley, Shelley's film, uh, Perfect Picture 2. Mm. You know, we never really interacted on screen, but we interacted off screen. And um, I'm, I'm hoping to be able to do proper work with people like him and all the other um, legends and, and up and coming legends in, in that industry. What change would you want to see in, in our industry? What have you observed? What do you think that we can do better? Well, I mean, I was on, I was shooting this movie recently and I noticed what a struggle it is to find locations that you can control, you know, with sound and things like that. And I noticed that this is why Hollywood, they build these huge studios yeah. where everything is controlled and you can, you can build a village, you can build a market, you can build a bank, you can build skyscrapers, whatever. It's all contained within that studio and you can shoot. I think if, um, I think we would move forward much quicker as, a, as an industry, if we had one of those, where you can easily, if you want Kanishi markets, we can build a replica of Kanishi markets. All the, everybody there is an actor who is, you know, getting the work done, you know. We shot some public scenes and we had people standing around and we had to tell them to move and how to, and then some people, somebody came to argue with us because we were tapping power from his shop to, to power the lights for us to do this. And I just, I just, I just found the whole thing so so sad. I'm, I'm, I'm imagining how, how the struggle is on set. Because yeah. I've seen and this is one of the reasons why I prefer stage. Mm -hmm. I've, I've seen some movies that the people are just there. They are looking into their cameras for you to see that, yeah, the people came to film. Yeah, you can't help it. And yeah. sometimes you are, you are filming and one person wants to appear on the, in the TV. Mm -hmm. So he will, pre he will pretend he doesn't know what is going on and just come and walk out. That's an extra. <laughs> <laughs> Come and walk across and spoil yeah. your shot, and now we have to start all over again, you know. Mm -hmm. So uh, one of the things I really wish we could do is that I don't know if I don't know if the powers that be 
we'll think it's, it's worth investing into. But mm -hmm. if we had something like that, we could control daylight, we could control night, we could control sound. Yeah. You know, sometimes you are shooting and then some loud motorcycle will come and pass and spoils the shot. Meanwhile, it's a shot you are emotionally getting into and they spoilt it because, sorry, sound is bad. Can we do it? Can we go again? Then you have to go again. And if you are not lucky, another motorcycle will come and pass. And then, and then before you realize, one, when we were shooting this one, just when we were getting ready to shoot, somebody started playing music, mm -hmm. time for party. Mm -hmm. They're, they're playing party music. So, boom, boom, check, boom. So, obviously, we can't shoot. So, we had to go and beg the DJ that we beg him. He should give us two hours. For two if, hours. if his customers are there. Yeah. So, mm -hmm. the two hours, we, he, 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 he agreed and gave us two hours. Mm -hmm. We shot, uh, we couldn't do much. Within the, after two hours, the music went back up again. Mm -hmm. Then we went to beg him. Then he reduced it half. Then... When we left and when the people who came to who went to bed came back, he increased it again. Mm. And they had to go and bed. You know all these things. And we all and we the actors are waiting to shoot and you are getting tired because yeah. these things are happening. He finished around three AM. He he they closed around three AM. And because of that we had to continue shooting till seven AM, which we saw. So this is through the night. Yeah. Something we could have done finished within a few hours. Mm and we're gone, we had to. So those are, those are the things, those are the things, Charlie. People watch you, they are happy. They hear your voice, they are excited. Mm. What makes you happy? How do you get yourself entertained? I think performing makes me happy. Um, that, the feeling I got when I went on stage for the very first time, I haven't, I haven't, um, been, I haven't forgotten, mm. you know, and, when you when you are in the when you are in the motion of performing, it's a beautiful feeling, you know. Uh, when I was playing Odewale and I'm delivering the lines and everything is going so well, if you if you are if you have a performer spirit, that that sort of thing makes you very very happy. Um, outside that, um, if I get some good music, I'm happy. If I get to draw or write, I'm trying to. Get, go into writing. Mm. So I guess anything creative, you know, that exercises that part of me makes me happy. I would want you to sign off because I know you're a TV presenter. Um, have I you was, quit? I was a long time ago. Why did you quit? Uh, the money wasn't good. <laughs> <laughs> what, was, what was the... Okay, it, have you worked um, with just a media house? Yeah, I worked with a media house. I've forgotten... Like just one media house. Okay, uh, it's because was, of the follow-up question. That's yeah, why I'm what asking. What happened was mm -hmm. when I started working as a TV presenter, I was on a TV channel called Viasat One. Okay. So Viasat One was where we shot all the episodes. Mm -hmm. And then when um, I ended my relationship with them, that show went to TV Africa mm -hmm. and I think GH, what, GH1 or something. Mm -hmm. So the, 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 seri the episodes of the talk show moved to I think a couple of TV stations before it finally fizzled out. So my follow-up question, what was the weirdest amount you were paid? It's the reason I asked if it's just one media house, cause uh, yes, what was the weirdest? What was yeah, the amount very, I was giving you? To be you? very honest with you, I can't remember how much they gave me. Mm -hmm. I can't remember, but um, first they, ag they agreed that it would be per month then it was per episode, mm -hmm. and then I think as their money was becoming basa, mine was also becoming basa, and then it, become, it became something else. Now, so actually, it was okay. Yeah, I've done small, mm -hmm. you know, it was fun. Mm -hmm. I got to interview, I was one of the first people to interview Kwame Eugene when he was coming out. I was one of the first people to interview Kim Promise, um, Eddie K, uh, who else? A lot of these up-and-coming guys, I got to I got to interview them around the time they were beginning to to yeah. to block. Kwesi Arthur mm -hmm. was one of the first people to interview Kwesi Arthur too. So it was it was a fun it was a fun nice period. Mm -hmm. yeah. Beyond the excitement, would you say that what you sought to do has been financially gratifying? No, at least not yet. Um, I think with things like this, 
there's a time. The universe or the powers that be will decide how much, how much reward you get after what time, how much time you put in. Mm -hmm. When you go into a venture like this, you don't get to say in three years' time, I'll be financially self-sufficient. You don't get to say things like that. Your job is to do your very best and be consistent. And then whenever, whenever they decide, you know, one day you realize you are, you, are, you, are, you are making big money. I mean, every actor, almost all the actors that we saw that blew up were in the industry for over 10 years, but nobody knew who they were. Then all of a sudden, one project, they did one project and then boom. You know, uh, everybody knew. Samuel L. Jackson was like that. Sylvester Stallone was like that. Um, almost all of them. Uh, Van Damme, too, was like that. You spend, you, you have to put in, the powers that be demand that you put in a certain amount of time before people, people see you. Yeah, yeah so um, I'm okay with that. I'm, I just hope I get, I have the grace to keep performing well raising my raising the bar being consistent and then if uh if the laws of the universe are true one day one day it will look it will be very nice yeah, yeah. thank you for coming on the show um i'm a big fan in fact uh, i've watched i've watched you i've watched the girls are not to blame i watched um, a call something inspector a, a call, call a detective yeah. call yes i've watched i've watched a couple of uh, productions that you are in and then my producer is also a big fan. In fact, when she heard that you were coming, she started talking to me about you, what, is it the beginning of the year or so? I see. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah she's awesome. <laughs> Thank you so much for coming. It's been, it's been an honor to have you on the show. But like I mentioned, you sign out for us. All right, ladies and gentlemen, this has been Talk Attainment with the great Abrantia Pat, right? Yes. And Andrew Tando Adote. See you next time. Same place, same time. Bye-bye.